Part 8 of Astounding Stories, January 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories, Part 8 Phantoms of Reality, Chapter 7 The Crimson Murderess. Hope murmured, The three-part music comes first. There will first be the spiritual. An orchestra was seated on the stage in a semicircle. It was composed of men and women musicians, and there seemed to be over a hundred of them. They sat in three groups. The center group was about to play. In a solemn hush, the leaderless choirs, with all its players garbed in white, began its first faint note. I craned to get a clear view of the stage. This white choir seemed almost all windwood. There were tiny pipes and little series such as Pan might have used, flutes and flagellettes, and round-bellied little instruments of clay like ocarinas, and pitch pipes, long and slender as a marsh reed. In a moment I was lost in the music. It began softly with single muted notes from a single instrument, echoed by the others, running about the choir like a will-o'-the-wisp. It was faint as though very far away, made more sweet by distance. And then it swelled, came nearer. I had never heard such music as this. Primitive, it was not that, nor barbaric, nothing like the music of our ancient world nor was it what I might conceive to be the music of our future. A thing apart, unworldly, ethereal. It swept me, carried me off. It was an exaltation of the spirit lifting me. It was triumphant now, it surged, but there was in its rhythm, the beat of its every instrument, nothing but the soul of purity. And then it shimmered into distance again, faint and exquisite music of a dream crooning, pleading, the speech of whispering angels. It ceased. There was a storm of applause. I breathed again. Why, this was what music might be in our world, but was not. I thought of our blaring jazz. Hope said, Now they play the physical music. Then Sensua will dance with Blanca. We will see then which one the king chooses. On the stage all the torches were extinguished save those which were red. The arena was darker than before. The stage was bathed with a deep crimson. Music of the physical senses. It was, indeed, no more like the other choir than is the body to the spirit. There were stringed instruments playing now, deep-toned, singing zithers, and instruments of rounded, swelling bodies, like great viols, with sensuous, throbbing voices. Music with a swift rhythm, marked by the thump of hollow gourds. It rose with its voluptuous swell into a paean of abandonment, and upon the tide of it the crimson sensua flung herself upon the stage. She stood motionless for a moment that all might regard her. The crimson torchlight bathed her, stained crimson the white flush of her limbs, her heavy shoulders, her full, rounded throat. A woman in her late twenties, voluptuous of figure, with crimson veils half hiding, half revealing it, a face of coarse, sensuous beauty, a face wholly evil, and it seemed to me wholly debauched, dark eyes with beaded lashes, heavy lips painted scarlet, a pagan woman of the streets. One might have encountered such a woman swaggering in some ancient street of some ancient city, flaunting the finery given her by a rich and profligate eastern prince. She stood a moment with smoldering, passion-filled eyes, gazing from beneath her lowered lids. Her glance went to the king's canopy and flashed a look of confidence, of triumph. The king answered it, with a smile. He leaned forward over his railing, watching her intently. With the surge of the music she moved into her dance. 
Slowly she began, quite slowly. A posturing and swaying of hips like a notch girl. She made the rounds of the musicians leering at them. She stood in the whirl of the music, almost ignoring it, stood at the front of the stage with a gaze of slumberous, insolent passion flung at the king. A knife was in her hand now. She held it aloft. The red torchlight caught its naked blade. With shuddering fancy I seemed to see it dripping crimson. She frowned and struck it at a phantom lover. She backed away. She stooped and knelt. She knelt and seemed with her empty arms to be caressing a murdered lover's head. She kissed him, rained upon his dead lips her macabre kisses. And then she was up on her bare feet, again circling the stage. Her anklets clanked as she moved with the tread of a tigress. The musicians shrank from her waving blade. A girl in white veils was suddenly disclosed standing at the back of the stage. Derek whispered, "'Is that Blanca?' "'Yes,' whispered Hope. Blanca stood watching her rival. The crimson sensua passed her, took her suddenly by the wrist, drew her forward. For an instant I thought it might have been rehearsed. I saw Blanca as a slim, gentle girl in white, with a white headdress. A dancer who could symbolize purity, now in the grip of red passion. An instant, and then horror struck us. And I could feel it surge over the audience. A gasp of horror. The frightened girl in white tried to escape. The musicians wavered and broke. I stared, stricken, with freezing blood. Upon the stage the knife went swiftly up. It came down, then up again. The red sensua stood gloating. The knife she waved aloft was truly dripping crimson now. With a choked, gasping scream, the white girl of the toilers crumpled and fell. She lay motionless at the feet of the crimson murderess. Chapter 8 Why, This Is Treason! There was a gasp. The audience sat frozen. On the stage, with no one lifting a hand to stop her, the crimson murderess made a leap and vanished. A moment, and then the spell broke. A girl in the audience screamed. Someone moved to stand up and overturned a seat with a crash. The amphitheater under the canopy broke into a pandemonium. Screams and shouts, crashing of seats, screaming, frightened people struggling to get out of the darkness. The torches on the stage were dropped and extinguished. The darkness leapt upon us. Derek and I were gripping hope. We were struck by a bench flung backward from in front. People were rushing at us. We were swept along in the panic of the crowd. I heard Derek shout, We must keep together! We fought, but we were swept backward. We found ourselves outside the canopy. Torchlight was here. It glimmered on the pool of water. People were everywhere rushing past us, some one way, some another, aimless with the shock of terror upon them. Under the canopy they were still screaming. I was momentarily separated from Derek and Hope. I very nearly stumbled into the pool. A girl was here, crouched on the stone bank. Her wet crimson veils clung to her white body. Her long, wet hair lay on her. I stumbled against her. She raised her face. Eyes wide with terror. Mute, painted red lips. I heard Derek calling again. Charlie! I shoved my way back to him. The crowd was thinning out around us. Girls were climbing from the pool, rushing off in terror, to mingle with the milling throng. Among the crowd now, down by the edge of the bay, I saw the sinister figures of men come running. The toilers, miraculously appearing everywhere. I saw across the pool a terrified girl crouching. A huge man in a black cloak came leaping. The colored lights in the trees glittered on his upraised knife-blade as it descended. The girl fell with a shuddering scream. The murderer turned and whirled away into the crowd. Charlie! 
I was back with Derek and Hope. Hope stood trembling, with her hand pressed against her mouth. Derek gripped me. That cloak, get it off. He ripped his crimson cloak from him and tossed it away. He jerked mine off. Too dangerous. That's the crimson badge of death tonight. We stood revealed in the clothes of our own world. My business suit, in which that day I had worked in Wall Street. Derek in his swagger uniform. He stood drawn to his full height, a powerful figure. The wires of our mechanism showed at his wrists. They dangled at the back of his neck, mounting to that strangely fashioned electrode clamped to his head. Strange, awe-inspiring figure of a man. We were momentarily alone under the colored lights of the trees. Hope murmured, But they will see us, see you. Derek's face was grim, but at her words he laughed harshly. See us? What matter? He swung on me. It forces our hand. We've got to come out in the open now. This murder, this king. My God, what a fool to let himself get into such a condition as this. His people, this chaos. What a fool. He had drawn his dirk. I realized that I was holding mine. Near us the body of a crimson noble was lying under a tree. A sword was there on the ground. Derek sprang for it, waved it aloft. I think that no more than a minute or two had passed since the murder. Down by the water the boats were hastily loading and leaving the dock. One of them overturned. There were screams everywhere. Red forms lay inert upon the ground where they had been trampled or stabbed. But the prowling figures of the toilers now seemed to have vanished. Derek gestured. Look at the palace, the garden. Beyond the canopy I could see the dim garden surrounding the palace. I glimpsed the high fence and the gateway in front. A mob of toilers was there. The guard at the gate had fled. The mob was surging through. Men and women in the vivid garments of the fields, armed with sticks and clubs and stones and the implements of agriculture. They milled at the gate, rushed through, scattered over the garden. Their shouts floated back to us in a blended murmur. We were standing only a dozen feet from the edge of the pavilion. No one seemed yet to have noticed us. A few straggling lights had come on under the canopy. I could see the dead lying there in the wreckage of the overturned seats. Derek said, We can't help it. It's done. Look at them. They're attacking the palace. This mob springing miraculously into existence. I realized that the toilers had planned that if Sensua were chosen they would attack the festival. The murder of Blanca had come as big a surprise to them as to us. Come on. Can you get into the palace, Hope? The king must have gotten back there. Get your wits, girl. Derek stood gripping her, shaking her. Yea, there's an underground passage. He probably went that way. From the palace gardens the shouts of the mob sounded louder now, and from within the building there was an alarm bell tumultuously clanging. Hope gasped. This way. She led us back into the pavilion. We clambered over its broken seats, past its gruesome huddled figures. Some were still moving. We went to a small door under the platform. A dim room was here, deserted now. Against the wall was a large wardrobe closet. Stage costumes were hanging in it. The closet was fully twenty feet deep. We pushed our way through the hanging garments. Hope fumbled at the blank board wall in the rear. Her groping fingers found a secret panel. A door swung aside and a rush of dank, cool air came at us. The dark outlines of a tunnel stretched ahead. In, Charlie! I crouched and stepped through the door. Hope closed it behind us. The tunnel passage was black, but soon we began to see its vague outlines. Derek, sword in hand, led us. I clutched my dirk. We went perhaps five hundred feet. Down at first, then up again. I figured 
We were under the palace gardens now, as the tunnel was winding to the left. There were occasional small lights. Derek whispered to Hope, The toilers don't know of this? No. Where does it bring us out? I whispered. Into the lower floor of the castle. The king must have gone this way. There might be a guard, Derek. What will you do? He laughed. I can handle this mob. Disperse it. You'll see. And handle the king. He laughed again grimly. There's no Blanca to choose now. The tunnel went round a sharp angle and began steeply ascending. Derek stopped. How much further, Hope? Not far, she whispered. We crept forward. The tunnel was more like a small corridor now. Beyond Derek's crouching figure, in the dimness, I could see a doorway. Derek turned and gestured to us to keep back. A palace guard was standing there. His pike went up. Who are you? A friend. But the man lunged with his pike. Derek leapt aside. His sword flashed. The flat of it struck the fellow in the face. Derek, with incredible swiftness, was upon him. They went down together, and before the man could shout, Derek had struck him on the head with the sword hilt. The guard lay motionless. Derek climbed up as we ran forward to join him. I noticed now, for the first time, that in his left hand Derek held a small metal cylinder. A weapon, strange to me, which he had brought with him. He had not mentioned it. He had produced it when menaced by this guard. Then he evidently decided not to use it. He shoved it back in his pocket. He whirled on us, panting. Hurry! Close that door! We closed the door of the tunnel. Charlie, help me move him. We dragged the prostrate figure of the unconscious guard aside into a shadow of the wall. We were in a lower room of the palace. It seemed momentarily unoccupied. Overhead we could hear the footsteps of running people. A confusion in the palace, and outside in the garden the shouts of the menacing throng of toilers. And above it all the wild clanging of the alarm bell from the palace tower. Derek said swiftly, Get us to the king! Hope led us through the castle corridors and up a flight of steps to the main floor. The rooms here were thronged with terrified people, crimson nobles in their bedraggled finery of the festival. In all the chaos no one seemed to notice us. We mounted another staircase. We found a vacant room. Through its windows we looked a moment, gazing into the garden. It was jammed with a menacing mob, which milled about, leaderless, waving crude weapons, shouting imprecations at the palace. At the foot of the main steps the throng stood packed, but none dared to mount. A group of the palace guards stood on the platform over the moat. Derek turned away impatiently. Let's get to the king. We mounted to the upper story. The castle occupants stared at Derek and me as we passed them. A group of girls at the head of the staircase fled before us. The king, Derek demanded, which is his apartment? Hurry! Hope we have no time now. We found the frightened king seated on a couch with his counselors around him. It was a small room in this top story of the castle, with long windows to the floor. I saw that they gave on to a balcony which overlooked the gardens. There were perhaps twenty or thirty people huddled in the room. A confusion existed here as everywhere else, no one knowing what to do in this crisis. And that cursed alarm bell wildly adding to the turmoil. We paused at the doorway. Now, whispered Derek. He drew himself to his full height. His eyes were flashing. It was a Derek I had not seen before. He wore an air of mastery, as though he and not the frightened, trembling monarch on the couch were master here and as I stared at him that instant in this primitive, chaotic environment, the power of him swept me. A conqueror, the strange electrode clamped to his head gave him an aspect miraculous, awe-inspiring. He strode forward across the apartment. 
the king was just giving some futile, vague command to be transmitted to his guards down below. A hush fell over the room at our appearance. The king half stood up, then sank back. Why, why, who? I saw Robar here. His long crimson cloak hung from his shoulders, with its hood thrown back. Beneath it, as it parted in front, his leather uniform was visible. A sword was strapped to his waist. He was striding back and forth with folded arms, frowning. But his gaze was very keen. Robar was not frightened. He seemed rather to be gauging the situation, pondering how he might turn it to his own ends. He stopped short and swung about to face us. His jaw dropped with surprise, amazement at our strangeness. Derek confronted him. His bulk and huge weight towered even over Derek. The king gasped and sat helplessly staring. Robar spoke first. Who are you? This mob must be dispersed. Don't stand looking at me like that, man. Derek spoke in a friendly fashion, but vehemently. This is no time for explanations. They were menacing each other. Robar's heavy hand fell to his sword, but Derek boldly pushed him away. He faced the king. Your Majesty. The king stared blankly at him. The title was no doubt strange to this realm, but no stranger than Derek's aspect. Your Majesty. But the noise from the garden, the confusion which now broke out in the room, and that damnable clattering bell drowned his words. The king found his voice. "'Be quiet, all of you!' He was on his feet. He demanded of Derek again, "'Who are you?' Derek said swiftly, "'I'll show you. I can disperse this mob. Charlie, come!' It seemed as though the gaze of everyone in the room went to me. I drew myself up and flashed defiance back at them. And I followed Derek to one of the balcony windows. He went through it, with me after him. I stood at the threshold, watchful of the room behind us. Robar was standing aside, and I saw now the woman Sensua with him. They were whispering, staring at me and Derek. I had been wondering why, when Sensua must have known that the king would choose her, why she had dared to murder her rival. I thought now, as I saw her with Robar, that I could guess the reason. She loved Robar, not the king. Robar was plotting to put himself on the throne, using Sensua as a lover to that end. He had doubtless persuaded her to this murder, knowing it would arouse the toilers, precipitate this chaos which was what he wanted. Scheming scoundrel, I could not forget the look of desire on his face as he had accosted Hope. And now Derek appeared, to add an unknown element to Robar's plans. There was no way he could guess who or what we were. I saw that he was puzzled, was whispering to Sensua about us, doubtless wondering how to handle us. I saw, too, that there were half a dozen crimson-cloaked men here who were not frightened. They had gathered in a group. They stood with hands upon their swords, eyeing me and watching Robar as though at a sign from him they would rush me. On the balcony Derek stood with a light from the room upon him. The crowd saw him. The main gateway of the palace was just under his balcony. The crowd had now started up the steps to where the guards were standing at the top. At the sight of Derek the mob let out a roar, and those on the steps retreated down again. Derek stood at the balcony rail, silent with upraised arms, gazing down upon the menacing throng. There was a moment of startled silence as he appeared. Then the shout broke out louder than before. The crowd was milling and pushing, but still leaderless. An aimless activity. Someone threw a stone. It came hurtling up. It missed Derek and struck the castle wall, falling almost at my feet. Derek did not move. He stood calmly gazing down, stood like an orator waiting for the confusion to die before he would speak. 
from the platform, just beneath Derek, the guards were staring wonderingly up, awed, startled. To the right, a wing of the building turned an angle. The castle tower was there. It rose perhaps a hundred feet higher than our balcony. On the railed platform balcony girding its top, I saw the figures of other guards standing, gazing down at Derek. The clanging bell up there was suddenly stilled. I became aware of the king close behind me. His voice rang out. "'What are you doing? How dare you!' Derek whirled. "'You fool! To what a pass you have come! Your people in arms against you!' His violent words brought the king's anger. "'How dare you! This is treason!' I stood alert, with my hand upon my dirk. There would be conflict here. I felt that we could not hold it off more than a moment longer. My mind leapt to that metal cylinder Derek had concealed. A weapon? Then why did he not have it out now? His eyes were flashing. The aspect of power, of confidence, upon him was unmistakable. It heartened me. I took a step toward him. He smiled faintly. Wait, Charlie. The king gasped again. How dare you! Why, this is treason! Robar, seize him! Hope was beside me, her eyes watching the room. Robar came striding forward. Derek rasped. You perhaps have some sense. Lead his majesty away. Take care of him until this is over. They stood with crossing glances, and upon Robar's face a look queerly sinister had come. A smile, sardonic. He said abruptly to the king, I think we should let him have his way. What harm? He gestured, and Sensua came forward. The crimson murderess. Her voluptuous figure was shrouded in a crimson cloak. Her heavy painted lips smiled at the king. Her rounded white arms went over his shoulders. Leonto, do as Robar says. Let this stranger try. It can do no harm. The king yielded to her. I watched as she and Robar urged him through an archway that gave into the adjoining apartment. No wonder Robar was sardonically smiling. Derek had played into his hand. We did not know it then, but we were soon to find it out. Chapter 9 Alexander Derek turned back to the balcony. It had been a brief interlude. The mob in the garden, the soldiers at the top of the stairway, and the other guards high on the bridge of the tower were all standing gazing. Shouts again arose as Derek appeared. Again he raised his arms. This time his voice rang out. Silence, all of you! I am a friend! Silence! At first they did not heed him. Then someone shouted, Quiet! Listen to him! Let him talk! The crowd was bellowing, and then they ceased. The bell was still. In the hush came Derek's voice. I am a friend. I come from foreign lands, from distant lands of strange people and strange magic. For an answer, the crowd shouted and milled in confusion. A stone came up, and then another. Derek stood immovable, like a statue gazing down at them. I command you to disperse. You will not? Then look at me. Look at me, all of you. My will is law beyond this king, beyond these palace soldiers, beyond any power you have ever known. Then I knew a part of Derek's purpose. He had pressed the mechanism at his wrist. He stood imperious with upraised arms. The garden was in a tumult, but in a moment it died. A wave of horror swept the crowd, a freezing, incredulous horror. They stood staring, incredulous, silent, swept with a widening wave of horror. The figure of Derek on the balcony was fading, turning luminous. A wraith, a ghost of his menacing shape standing there. 
it faded until it was almost gone. And then, as he reversed the mechanism, it materialized again. A moment passed, then he stood again solid before them. His voice rang out. "'Will you obey me now? I am a friend of the Toilers!' They were prostrate before him. There is no fear more terrible than the fear of the supernatural. In all of history there has been in our world no worship more abject than the worship and fear of a primitive people for its supernatural god. On the platform beneath the balcony the palace soldiers stared up, horrified. Then they too were prostrate before Derrick's threatening gestures and commanding voice. I stood watching, listening. And suddenly, from the prostrate crowd, a man leapt up. In the silence his amazed voice carried over the garden. "'Alexander! It is our Prince Alexander! Our lost Prince!' He stood staring at Derrick, his arms gesturing to his comrades around him. He shouted it again. "'Our rightful king! Come back to us! Don't you recognize him? I saw him go! He went like that, fading into a ghost! Ten years ago, when Leonto killed his father and would have killed him had he not escaped!' The crowd was standing up now. They recognized Derrick. There was no doubt of it. The garden was ringing with the tumultuous shouts. "'Alexander, our lost prince has come back to us!' My head was whirling with it. Derrick, prince of this realm? I could see that it was true. Escaped from here as a young lad when his throne was usurped. Returning now a man to claim his own and suddenly he turned and flashed me his smile. The din from the garden drowned his words. The crowd was shouting, "'Alexander, our lost prince!' The king's guards on the lower platform stood sullen, confused. I heard footsteps behind me. I whirled around. From the room the group of Robar's crimson nobles were rushing toward me. Their swords were out. One of them shouted, "'Kill them now! We must kill them and have done!' There were five or six men in the group. They were no more than ten feet away from me. They came leaping. I stood in the window opening, with only my dirk to oppose them. I shouted, Derek! Derek! I think I took a step backward. I was out on the balcony. It flashed over me. Derek and I were caught out here. The first of the red-cloaked figures came hurtling through the doorway. I leapt to avoid his sword. I saw the others crowding behind him. Then I felt Derrick shove me violently aside. I half fell, but recovered myself at the balcony rail. Five of the crimson nobles were on the balcony. Derrick confronted them. His aspect made them pause. They stood with outstretched swords. The garden was silent, the crowd stared up, and in the silence Derrick roared, "'Get back, all of you!' Go back inside. Back, or I'll kill you!" In Derrick's right hand he held the cylinder outstretched, leveled at the menacing nobles. Back, I say! But instead they rushed him. There was a flash. From the cylinder it seemed that a ray spat out, a flash of silver light. It caught the three men who were in advance of the others. Their swords dropped with a clatter to the balcony floor. They stood transfixed. An instant. Derrick's silver ray played upon them. The red cloaks were painted with its silver sheen. They were shimmering. I gasped, staring. The other nobles beyond the ray had fallen back, and they too stood staring in horror. Another instant. The three figures wavered. I saw the face of one of them, with the shock of incredulous horror still upon it. A face turning luminous, a face erased, with only the staring eyes to mark where it had been. There was a moment when the three stricken men stood like shimmering ghosts, with Derrick's deadly ray upon them. Then they were gone. It seemed, just as they vanished, that they were falling through the balcony floor. Derrick snapped off his ray, 
he rasped. Back into that room, I tell you. The remaining nobles fled before him. He turned again to the balcony rail. My people, yes, I am Alexander. I had not thought you would recognize me so soon. But you are right. The time has come for me to claim my inheritance. And I will rule you justly. His cylinder was still in his hand. He swept a watchful glance behind him. I thought of Robar. He was in the next room with the king. Had they seen this attack upon Derrick? They must have heard the crowd shouting, Alexander! It seems strange they did not appear. I recall now, as I look back to this moment on the balcony, that I suddenly thought of Hope. She had been beside me just before the nobles attacked. I did not see her now. I was startled, but thought of her was driven from my mind. From within the palace a scream sounded, a girl screaming. But it was not Hope's voice. A girl screaming and then shouting, The king is dead! Derek came rushing at me. Charlie, that... we heard it again. The king is dead! We hurried into the adjoining room. There was no one to stop us, no one up here now who dared oppose Derek. The terrified nobles in the room fell cringing before him. Alexander, spare us. We are loyal to you. He strode past them. In the adjacent apartment we found the king lying upon the floor. A wound in his throat welled crimson. He had evidently been lying here alone, had just now been found by a girl who had entered. He was not quite dead. Derek bent over him. He opened his eyes. He gasped faintly. Robar killed me. Robar and that accursed crimson sensua. His voice trailed away. The light went out of his staring eyes. Derek laid him gently back on the floor. And as though already the news of his death had miraculously spread, the bell in the castle tower began tolling. Not clanging now, tolling, with slow, solemn accent. The crowd evidently recognized it. We could hear the shouts, Death! Death has come! Derek's eyes were blazing as he stood up. The end, Charlie. I would not have planned this, and yet... He did not finish. He whirled, rushed back to the other room and to the balcony. The scene was again in confusion, the crowd milling, voices shouting, The king is dead! At the edge of the garden a woman's shrill, hysterical laughter rose over the din. Derek called, Yes, the king is dead! He paused, then he added, if you want me, if I have your loyalty, I will claim my throne. A tumult interrupted him. Alexander! King Alexander! He spread his arms, but he could not silence them. The king is dead! Long live King Alexander! A wave of it swept over the garden, engulfing the castle. At the main entrance, Leonto's soldiers stood sullen, listening to it. Derek stood triumphant. His hands were outstretched, palms down. But up the circular bridge at the top of the tower there was a sudden commotion. The soldiers up there had vanished, moved back within the tower to make room for other figures. I stared amazed, transfixed. A huge man in leather garments was there, with a sword stuck in his wide belt, a man with a bullet head, a heavy face, gazing down. Robar, and held in front of him the slender figure of a girl. Hope! He clutched her, his thick arm encircling her breast. With sinking heart I realized what had happened. Hope had moved away from me. Everyone in the room had been intent upon Derek. Robar had come quietly in, after murdering the king, had seized Hope, stifled her outcry, and had taken her up into the tower and I promised Derek that I would shield this girl from harm. The horror of it, the self-condemnation of it, swept me, froze me to numbness. I could not think. I could only stand and stare. 
Robar held Hope like a shield before him. The low railing hardly reached her knees. A sheer drop to the garden beneath. He held her tightly, and in his free hand I saw his dirk come menacingly against her white throat. His voice called, Silent down there! Alexander, you traitor! Silence! Derek stared up. The triumph faded from him. He stared, stricken. The crowd stared. The soldiers on the lower platform ceased their shouting and gazed up at these new actors, come so unexpectedly upon the stage. Again Robar called, to the guards this time. I represent your King Leonto. This Alexander is a traitor to us all, and he cannot harm me. I defy him. Look at him. I defy him to use his evil weapon upon me." Derek was silent. A single adverse move and Robar's knife would stab into Hope's throat. Derek's ray was powerless. A flash from it would have killed Hope, not Robar. The King's soldier saw Derek's indecision. One of them shouted, "'He cannot harm us! Look, he is frightened!' The crowd recognized Hope. They began calling her name and calling, "'Master Robar, do not harm our hope!' "'I will not harm her. Not if you do what I tell you. Leave the garden. Go quietly. I will deal with this traitor.' He added to the guards, "'Go up and seize him. He cannot hurt you. Traitor, seize him. If he does not yield, if any of his crowd attacks you, then I will kill hope.' Derek stood clinging to the balcony rail. With Robar's watchful gaze upon him, he did not dare turn or move. I was standing back from the balcony, behind Derek and partly in the room. No one thought of me. No one from outside could see me. And I, who had played no part in this, save that one I had neglected, suddenly saw my role. My cue was sounding. My role to play here upon this tumultuous stage. I turned back to the dim room. A few frightened men and girls were here. They were all crowding forward, gazing through the windows at the scene outside. No one noticed me, but I saw, with sudden realization, my role to play. I darted across the room, out into the dim, deserted corridor of the castle. End of Part 8